My name is Lisa Feldman Barrett, and it's my very great honor to introduce to you today Hazel Marcus, who is speaking as the 2017 recipient of APS's highest scientific honor, the William James Fellow Award. Hazel was chosen for this award to recognize a lifetime of significant intellectual contribution to the science of psychology. She is our foremost authority on the self and its relation to culture. She currently serves as the Davis Brack Professor in the Behavioral Sciences and co-directs the Mind, Culture, and Society Lab at Stanford University. Hazel earned her doctorate in social psychology at the University of Michigan, where she became a faculty member before moving to Stanford University in 1994. In 1996, she co-founded the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, which empowers students and faculty to investigate the ways in which race and ethnicity shape our institutions, our society, and our individual everyday lives. Hazel has helped to pioneer three different psychological domains. First, she was an innovator in social cognition in the 1970s with her groundbreaking conceptualization of the self as a cognitive schema that structures the processing of self-relevant information. I just have to say, when I entered graduate school in 1986, this was the first paper, actually, that my new advisor gave me to read on the self, which I was very interested in. Her concept of multiple selves was foundational in many subdisciplines of psychology. I could list them for you, but then, you know, we'd be here for an hour. Um, she also helped to found the field of cultural psychology, which examines how different cultures define core concepts in psychology, like the self and emotion, which um, had up to that point been considered universal, but actually vary quite significantly in their mental features across different groups of individuals. Her paper on cultural psychology with Shinobu Kitayama in, that was published in Psychological Review in 1991 has been cited over 18,000 times. 18,000 times, right? Since it was published, making it one of the most cited papers in the history of psychological science. Hazel's uh, third seminal contribution has been in the psychology of social class, trying to help us understand the ways in which social class influence our thoughts, our feelings, the way that we act towards one another, and has set the stage actually for um, health psychology and neuroscience to try to understand the ways in which social class gets under the skin um, and in biologically embedded. I can only think of a handful of psychologists in the world and I say this really without, you know, hyperbole, who approach Hazel's impact as a scientific leader and innovator. Her work has been cited over 70,000 times. Her top 10 papers on Google Scholar have been cited over 1,000 times. And her top 86 papers have been cited over 100 times. I don't even know how many, you could count probably on, on one hand the, the number of papers that I've had cited over a thousand times. <laughs> Hazel is a, an APS fellow. She's previously served as the president of the Society for Personality and Social Psychology. And last year she was elected to the National Academy of Sciences. She's won too many awards to name, but I've been present actually um, for many of those award addresses, and I'll tell you that you're really in for a treat today. Um, I was educated as a graduate student reading Hazel's work, and one of the great things about a life in science is that your intellectual heroes sometimes get to be your friends, too. Um, so as a personal note, I can tell you that um, Hazel is more than just brilliant. She's actually a lovely person who is full of grace and warmth. Today she'll be discussing the benefits of bringing interdependent values and practices to bear on more independent focused mainstream American culture. Um, and so I'd like you to please join me in work welcoming Hazel Marcus and congratulating her. Thank you, Lisa, for that very wonderful and fulsome introduction. And 
I must uh, return the favor by saying that all of you should go to Lisa's book signing today. It's a, on her wonderful new book called How Emotions Are Made, The Secret Life of the Brain. Look for it. You will see brilliance and grace displayed. I want to talk about many things today, um, probably too many, but I want to talk about interdependence, the interdependence that pervades many American cultures and psyches. In psychology, we know best, we know a great deal about independent ways of being. Um, these are ways of construing the self that are most familiar and most practiced in white, middle class, or college-educated contexts. Moreover, most of our formal institutions and most of our pervasive values privilege the independent way of being. Yet what I want to suggest today, and this is a work in progress, is that in our current diverse America, that the majority of Americans are actually more practiced and more familiar with a relatively interdependent way of being. And that as psychologists, in order to develop the, the comprehensive psychology that I think we all want to have, and, and, and secondly, to address those many real world problems that I think cry out for our psychologists' help, we need to understand this interdependence. Now, this interdependence is not the same interdependence that Shinam Bukitiyama and I have spent our time on in comparing East and West for the last couple of decades, although it does share a variety of elements that I'll talk about. And I've come to this way of, of thinking through my work at SPARC, which is a center at Stanford that I co-direct with Jennifer Eberhardt. SPARC stands for Social Psychological Answers to Real World Questions with, with a Q. And our goal at SPARC is to put together practitioners from a variety of fields, education, health, immigration, criminal justice, bring them together with social psychologists, and we do this in a series of research clinics that we have monthly, and we also have uh, on our website a solutions catalog with 50 evidence-based solutions to your everyday social psychological problems. What we're finding as we do this work is that many of the practitioners that we are, um, that are coming to our clinics and we're talking to across fields are finding out that their, the, their desired outcomes, the behavior changes that they're hoping to evoke, um, it's not happening. They seem to be uh, using an independent model of self with people who are relatively more interdependent or behaving in more interdependent ways. And my goal today is just to suggest that if we bring more attention to interdependence, we um, might have a little better luck. So as I start with uh, interdependence, I want to first talk about independence. So of course, you know, we, um, we are an in dependent nation. We began on a summer afternoon with this declaration. We are rooted in the idea of independence. This is such a strong value. Its resonance has no bounds. It's used to produce positive associations with every conceivable object. Here's a recent one. 56 men signed the Declaration of Independence. One man put it in a bottle. Jack. Um, independence is used uh, to, to attract the old and the young. Here it is to uh, independence for schools, independence for healthcare here on the right. Um, for the old, this is an aid for hearing aid in the bottom left. Declare your independence. And, um, and hear all the sounds of life, it says. And of course, with independence comes, what else? That other powerful American value, freedom. And freedom, you can put it in your cologne, as Tommy Hilfinger does here. You can wear it on your feet. Um, and then, of course, freedom, it doesn't have to be defined as choice, but in our recent worlds, freedom has um, come to be defined as the capacity to make choice. And you can see choice everywhere. You can choose smaller portions and fewer calories, or you can choose one of more than 20 donuts down on the left here. Or you can choose the right flooring, or you can make a bold choice and Figure out what you're supposed to do and then don't do it. That's my favorite expression of the powerful American norm of not following the norm. Okay, so uh, independence pervades our culture. Quickly, what do I mean by culture? So in recent work that I've done with Elena Connor, Elena is the executive director of Spark, um, we've defined culture in terms of four 
layers, four levels, um, that fit together into a dynamic called the culture cycle. And these layers are the idea level, big ideas about what's good, like independence and freedom and choice. Um, institutions and those institutional features, economic institutions, uh, government institutions, uh, scientific institutions, military institutions. Then interactions, interactions have to do with interactions with, with people, with norms, with artifacts, and then finally, the individual thoughts and feelings. But what's my, the most important set of features about this uh, complex, but, but trying to be simple, um, uh, dynamic here, is that the individual is not separate from the culture. The individual is a constituent part of the culture. So if as psychologists we want to understand this individual in the left-hand box here, we have to also know about those other layers that are constantly constituting uh, the individual. And of course the individual, because individuals are always changing and they are feeding their actions back into various layers of the culture cycle, Cultures themselves are not monolithic, of course, they're changing all the time, they, um, they are dynamic. So, always on the move. Now, culture, of course, is, is uh, usually invisible, um, especially when in independent culture, we don't like to believe that anything's influencing us. It's particularly like the water to the fish, hard to see. But one method for revealing culture, for lighting it up, of course, is cultural comparison. Let you see what's otherwise pretty invisible. And we've done a lot of this comparing Americans with East Asians. And when you do that, the, the full uh, independence of the, of the American culture comes into, into view. And I want to just quickly show you three very recent examples. There are now several decades of studies, um, thousands of studies that show that American cultures are drenched with independence and that this shows up in the thoughts, feelings, and actions of Americans. East Asian cultures are relatively more saturated in ideas and institutions, practices, um, individual attitudes of, of interdependence. So let me... Um, just show you a couple of these to make the point that American culture cycles foster independence when you compare them with East Asian cultural cycles, which foster interdependence. Let me give you an example. I'll start with a little puzzle for you. Imagine you come home from work one day. Your house is on fire. I'm sorry. Inside, your mother is asleep in one bedroom and your spouse is asleep in another bedroom. You have time to rescue only one of them. Who would you choose? Okay, you can rescue only one. Let me see a show of hands. How many of you would rescue? I, I, won't, I won't report. How many of you will, will rescue your spouse? Spouse, hands up for spouse. I can't really see up here, but anyway, hands down. Okay, let's see, hands up. Hands up for rescue your mother. Okay, well, I think, I think spouse wins. And when you um, look at the data, this is a study done by Susan Cross and her colleague, uh, Tu uh, Sui um, Feng um, Wu. And what you find in the Taiwanese response and the American response, the American response is more like the response in this room. Uh, people say that they would uh, rescue their spouse, given this choice. The Taiwanese, however, have show a very, very different response. They say they would rescue their mother. Now, when you ask Americans, you know, why? And they say, well, obviously, uh, the, my spouse was my free choice. This is the person I chose to uh, make my life with, to have my children with, to which the Taiwanese respond, you can always get another spouse. <laughs> and they say, they say, out of an abundance, out of an abundance of filial piety, that, you know, of course, you, there's only one mother. Your mother gave you life. Without your mother, there'd be no you, which I submit is, you know, pretty compelling, compelling logic <laughs> and shows these differences. In the study by um, Cross and Wu, there are ma uh, many, many other studies that I urge you to look at. This is another recent study by um, Jing Kung Na and a colleague S.K. Hong, 
And this is um, looking at Facebook use. And what they did is to look at the number of status updates and the number of likes. And of course, status updates are the places where you get to talk about yourself, right? And likes are where you get to comment on the products or, or of other people. And what they find is that in the three uh, European, Western, American groups here, the Americans, the British, and the Canadians, there's a relative balance of likes to status updates, and I should tell you this is uh, 87,000 um, entries that are shown here, but the Asians, and this is a collapsing of Koreans and Taiwanese and Japanese, show a different pattern, a clear difference for likes, which you might expect from more um, interdependent uh, uh, um, people, people with more interdependent tendencies, and they show fewer status updates talking about themselves. This is a very neat study because then they, they then get to, uh, they have studies where they have people spend the 20 minutes either giving likes or giving status updates, and then they um, switch people's tendencies from relatively more independent to relatively more interdependent. So this will be out in a couple of months. Um, finally, another uh, study out of our lab led by Cynthia Levine, Shinobu, Kiriyama, um, Yuri Muramoto, Carol Riff, many people, a big study with uh, uh, national sample data from the US and from Japan on culture and healthy eating. Um, healthy eating was measured by a standard index which has to do with fruits, vegetables, non-meat protein, these kinds of things that you do if you're a healthy eater. Independence and interdependence was measured in a common way. Um, for independence, items like it's important for me to have my own ideas. For interdependence, items like I should take into consideration others' advice when making work or family plans. And what you find is that interdependence, the blue line here, is a very clear predictor of healthy eating in the US, but not in Japan. And when you look at Interdependence, and you look in Japan, you can see that interdependence predicts healthy eating in Japan, but not in the US. So, and in both cases, these um, effects between healthy eating and independence and interdependence are mediated, as you would expect, by self control and autonomy in the US and by uh, spousal support and positive relations with others in Japan. So it appears that healthy eating, and also in many other studies, health itself goes with a good cultural fit, behaving in the way that is normatively appropriate in that, in that context. Now, um, it turns out, across these studies, when you're comparing Americans with East Asians, or North Americans with East Asians, that Americans at a high level of abstraction tend to have selves that are like these, the selves here under independent on the right. And East Asians tend to have selves that are more like those abstracted on the, on my left over there in, in um, the red. And this is because of the different sets of ideas and institutions and interactions that are fostering and scaffolding these different selves. The critical difference here is between um, what is salient or what is focal for the two selves. So the two figures are the same in both cases. There's a central circle in the middle that represents the self and surrounded by other smaller circles that represent significant others. The difference lies in the nature of the relationship between the self and the surrounding circles. On the left, on the interdependent self, the circles overlap. The emphasis is on the relationship, which we have depicted in red. When this self is guiding behavior, the referent of behavior is relationship and fulfilling expectations and obligations to maintain this relationship. It's the self that puts relationships first, wants to be similar or to fit in with others, um, seeks to adjust to others, feels rooted in tradition, history, place, and is relatively aware of one's place in the hierarchy. This is the kind of self that would give you a choice of, the, of mother to save. On the right, what we have here is the independent self. And here you see the circles, the difference is the circles are close to the self in the center, but they're separate. The emphasis is what's on the blue part here, which is what's inside the individual, the individual's thoughts, feelings, preferences, goals, motives, 
When this self is guiding behavior, the referent for behavior, the, the benchmark, the baseline for behavior is one's individual's own thoughts and preferences. The independent self wants to be individual rather than relational, unique rather than similar, influencing others rather than adjusting to them, and free relatively from tradition, place, and history rather than rooted into them, and actually equal, if not sometimes better than others. So these, two, these diagrams, they represent two ways of being a self, two construals, two mindsets about what this object, the person, is. We all have both of them. We have to. We have to have both of these to get through the day and certainly to get through life. But depending on your particular mix of cultural context, it's likely that one of these selves is going to be stronger and more frequently manifest in your behavior than others. They're both viable ways to be. They're both good ways. Um, it's just that one of these ways over here, the independent one, is more privileged. This is the one that, if you were going to pair it with good, with good in the IET, would, you would get faster responses here. This is the, the independent self, at least as far as our psychology goes. Now, then I, ha I have one other question I have to ask, which is, you know, why does this understanding of the self matter? So this is the William James Award Lecture, so I have to invoke William James, who told us that the self is really the central element in mental life. It's the self, he said, that regulates and mediates behavior. Your behavior is personal behavior, it's, it, so it matters what shape, what form the, the self takes. I think, I feel, I want, my thought, my goals, the referent is the self, but our self isn't the, the, uh, doesn't take the same form in all, in all cases. Okay, so I, there's a lot of different ways that I could try to make this point. In, it turns out that in the American case, what I'm, we're seeing now is that even though we've characterized American selves as independent, and certainly with compar in comparison to East Asian selves, they are, that actually there's interdependence is alive and well um, in, the, uh, in the American context as well. And many more selves take this relatively more interdependent form than I think as psychologists we, we understand. And it's, um, it's, it's to begin with the um, independent way is the way that's associated with more power and status, and that's probably one of the way, one of the reasons we have uh, less, uh, we've paid less attention to it. But let me um, show you that um, there are these uh, these similarities uh, in an interdependent self with some of the ways we have identified in Asian selves, and we did this in a recent book and that I did with um, Elena Connor, and we analyzed hundreds of studies in psychology psychology, sociology, political science, economics, and we analyzed eight cultural contexts for which there was enough data to try to argue whether that cultural context was one that fostered independence or instead fostered interdependence. And so here we have those contexts. These are the eight uh, in black on the, down the column on the, on the left here. These are the cultural contexts that the data suggest tend to promote independence, and you can see um, what they are. And these are the cultural contexts that, in contrast, tend to promote relatively more interdependent ways of being. Now, you can think about yourself. All of us are a big multicultural mix, depending on where we've spent our time. Maybe you were born in the East and grew up in the West. Maybe you were born of working class parents, but you spent all of your time around um, after you got your PhD in very highly educated contexts, you know, maybe you've worked in business but then switched to a nonprofit. So you have to figure out how you might um, come up with your own score for whether you are relatively more independent or whether you tend most of the time to be more interdependent depending on your mix of contexts. But I think you can see that if you are a white, a middle class man, for example, you're much more likely to have a well elaborated independent self than if you are a working class Latina, for example. And so I want to try to make the case of um, the importance of interdependence by focusing on the social class distinction because it's, um, I think, uh, 
uh, a really important one that helps us understand many of the problems, including our recent political divide that we're um, facing in this country. Now, how do you measure class? Most people agree today that educational attainment is the, the single best measure of class, and you can just see here the difference it makes in weekly earnings depending on your educational attainment. It's quite dramatic. Um, in the US, we are, and this is surprising to many people, we are a working class nation. 68% of Americans have less than a four-year degree. Only 32% have a college degree or higher. And what we know from that is middle class culture cycles are those that tend to foster independence. Working class culture cycles are those that tend to foster interdependence. Um, how to say that quickly? Let me just show you. Less money, less education means many, many different things about the context, which of course produce these different selves and scaffold these selves and, and keep feeding them. It means you're going to interact more with family and longtime friends. It means you'll move less, work jobs with less choice and control, teach children to fit in, observe hierarchy and follow tradition. It makes sense if you're raising children for a uh, less structured, unsafe world. Um, if you're raising children for um, a world that will, in which the world will be their oyster. You can uh, focus on the child's special talents and interests. Um, these will be worlds with fewer choices, among fewer and less attractive options, and in fact, there'll be more interdependent selves. And this, this actually, if you think about it, it, it makes sense. Um, interdependence is not just a uh, interesting philosophical stance on the self. It's actually a very useful strategy. If there are too few resources to go around, then relating and fitting in with other people helps build networks that can deliver both material and uh, emotional support when necessary. Adjusting to situations makes good sense when changing to them or inf changing them or influencing them is above your pay grade. Um, rooting yourself in location and tradition is likewise a good way to weather a relatively chaotic world, and that's a less resourced world often. And when you're at the lower ranks of the lower ranks rungs of the social ladder, it makes sense to know who's above you, who's who's below you. So that's that emphasis on hierarchy or um, how you're ranked. Consequently, working class um, people tend to see themselves in these more interdependent ways. I don't have time, but to just really um, suggest that. But let me. Um, uh, talk about one particular aspect, which are the social networks of people in working class contexts. And what you can see here on the red, um, the social networks of people in working class contexts tend to be very dense and interdependent. Everybody in the network knows each other. That's something common when you grow up in a place and you stay there and work rather than moving away to go to college. When you do that um, and get a college degree, you often start to have these more dispersed networks, many dispersed networks, where you have lots of ties, but the people, the ties are loose and the people don't know each other. In working class context, relationships then are more stable and enduring um, products of your environment. Over in middle class context, relationships become um, less permanent and more contingent on individual choice. One of the things about going away to college is you can invent yourself in some new way. You can choose who to be friends with. That's less true if you don't move away from where you grew up and everyone knows you. And the, there's very different ideas about what is good. So in working class context, more morality uh, focuses more on loyalty, maintaining relationships, fulfilling duties and obligations. Morality in middle class context takes some very different forms, which is satisfying the needs, desires, and volitions of the individual, or you might think of this as loyalty to, to the self, perhaps. Now, to give you an example of a kind of study that reveals this, I'll tell you about a recent vignette study that had a set of vignettes like this that people from middle class and, and working class backgrounds uh, answered. So this is the story of Stephen and the drunk uncle. Stephen has an uncle who has become increasingly hot-headed at recent family events. He tends to drink too much and has clashed with Stephen on several occasions. A year ago, Stephen got engaged, and as his wedding day comes closer, he is unsure that he wants his uncle to come to the event. What should he do? So here are two responses. One from a working class respondent, reflecting this greater interdependence, says, family is family. Unfortunately, he has to invite his uncle, but it would be good if he could have a conversation about his concern. Stephen certainly doesn't want his uncle ruining the event, but if he doesn't invite him, there would be bad blood. The middle class participant says, 
He shouldn't invite his uncle. People aren't important just because their family move on. So <laughs> you can see these are two very different responses to a dilemma about relationships. And in the 12 vignettes that pose these, this kind of conflict, you can see that middle class respondents were much more likely to suggest breaking off the old relationships, beginning the new relationships, as opposed to the working class respondents who said you had to find some way to maintain the relationship, that that was the, that was the most um, important thing to do. Now, there's many, many studies, a huge um, industry now of working on uh, social class as an important cultural context, and we know a lot about um, the differences. Independent selves tend to do, express the self, their attitudes and their opinions, they're more analytic, they emphasize choice, achievement, they take control, they pursue and implement goals, they take more risks, they negotiate better deals, they report greater self-esteem, they demonstrate more uniqueness, future time orientation, more possible selves, a lot of interpersonal consequences, they're less influenced by norms, they lie more, cheat more, show less empathy. Interdependent selves, it's, it's often the reverse of that, but there are some differences as well. They take less control, they perceive less choice for good reason, they have fewer choices. They're more holistic, more influenced by content, they're more likely to emphasize the integrity, the consistency, the stability of the self. They emphasize resilience, discipline, making do, getting by, surviving is a very important aspect of the way of being that one of, I think we understand much too little about in psychology. Interpersonal consequences, much more attention to others. If you are embedded in a set of dense networks and those others have uh, actions, have consequences for you, you will attend more to them. You adjust more to others, you conform more, you view relationships as morally binding. The, the best way to give you a full um, understanding of this would be, some elements of this would be to read Hillbilly Elegy. I don't know how many of you have had the opportunity to do that, but it's a great book that really gives some of the everyday life detail of, of living in more um, interdependent contexts. What you see is that for many people in the US, they are living, they are um, living in cultural cycles that are a cultural cycle that's not aligned. So there's a focus on independence in our ideas and our values comes across in our advertising. These values are in all of our formal institutions that everybody is subject to, economic, governmental institutions. But at the everyday level where people live their lives, there's much more interdependence going on and at the individual level. And so working class people are actually working our, our bicultural selves in many ways. And, and as America grows more and more unequal, um, and there's more and more income inequality, I suggest that we're going to become um, more and more different, and this clash between independence and interdependence is going to be more on the front, and we're going to have to figure out ways to contend with it. And that's what I want to do now, is show you quickly three examples where you see this clash between independence and interdependence, and those people who come with selves that are um, in which they are more interdependent or those, that way of being is more practiced and they're more used to doing it, um, it's difficult for them. Start with the educational setting. There's been a lot of work on first generation students. What is known across the country compared to continuing generation students, first generation students uh, do much less well. They drop out, they get lower grades, they interact less with professors, they make fewer friends. And when you start to um, look at the institutions, especially the elite institutions who are doing a good job of recruiting first generation students now, students with very good grades, very good scores, have the training. Um, for example, at Stanford, we have 18% first generation students now. But what you see is a highly independent institution that's trying to absorb students who are not very well practiced or familiar with that way of being. Take Stanford's academic motto here. Let the winds of freedom blow. Stanford embodies the pioneering spirit of the American West. Here, high achieving, risk taking students come together in a culture known for its intellectual, athletic, and artistic vitality. Well, that's good if you've come from a family where everyone's gone to college and you know what you want to do and you want to go out and be a mover and shaker and make your mark. If you're coming to college to get a college degree and figure out a career, you might want something a little bit different, at least at first. 
Here's also from the view book that Stanford sends students. Students have interdisciplinary freedom to select and combine areas uh, from more than 60 areas of study, extensive choice. Once again, extensive choice is good if you are used to making choices and you're used to having good alternatives and you're used to expressing your preferences and operating on the world in that way. If you're not, somebody guiding you to a major might be helpful. We looked at the letter that was sent to students. This came from the president, John Hennessy, um, at that time. And it's filled with independence all through the letter that talks about, I'm delighted you've decided to come to Stanford. You think Stanford is the right place. At Stanford, you have chance for personal exploration and your individual experiences. Um, you'll have a lot of chance for that. We took this letter. We tweaked it in a more interdependent way because we hypothesized that this would make first generation students feel more comfortable if they knew that we're delighted that you and your family have decided you should attend, St to attend Stanford. And it signaled that here at Stanford you could work with other people, you could collaborate, you would have interactions with peers, there were people like you. And we gave one letter or another to first gen and continuing students and we had them do a lot of different tasks after reading the one of these letters in the lab and what we found is what you see on the the left hand side here is when stanford was framed as a place for independence where you have to chart your own course and go your own way what you see is that the first generation students in red do significantly less well on a whole series of um, tangrams and word problems and all sorts of puzzles that we gave them. They thought they were um, evaluating tasks for the next year's first year class. Um, when Stanford instead is simply framed as a place for interdependence where, where families are included or at least mentioned, there's a place for family, relationships with others are important, you can collaborate, you can cooperate, just ways that signal that one's interdependent self might be of use here. You can see that um, those first generation students, there's, there's no difference and, and it doesn't uh, depress the uh, performance of the, of the the blue bars, the uh, continuing generation students. And um, we did these studies, and these were studies that were led by Nicole Stevens, who's at Northwestern University now. You can see that when Stanford is framed as a place of independence, the cortisol spikes for those students. This was a separate study. When Stanford is framed as a place where you can use your interdependent self, students, we would argue, are less stressed, and you don't, you don't see that effect. Now, what we, when we saw these results, we've, been, we've carried out a study, a four-year study that's just about um, finished. I'll show you the results from the, the first year. It, we thought that if we uh, gave students information that there were other students like them, first-generation students, and that Stanford would be challenging at first and they might know, not know what to do, but they could ask for help. There were people who would ask help them, and that was normative, we could uh, relieve some of that stress and improve performance. So we had them uh, see a videotape with eight different students talking about their experiences at, at Stanford, and this was done pre-matriculation before they entered Stanford. And here's uh, a, one statement from one student that says, even before I came to Stanford freshman year, I knew I would have a lot of freedom to choose what I wanted to do, and who I wanted to be, what classes to take, what to major in, what activities to participate in. It's wonderful to have that kind of freedom, but how do you know what to do? Being a first generation student, there's some things I couldn't ask my family. And it goes on, it says, I learned that you can't do it on your own, but if you ask for help, people at Stanford are right there to help you, making it normative that you don't have the information, but if you ask, the information is there. And so they read eight different sorts of um, uh, scenarios like this um, and then um, filled out lots of other questionnaires and so this is after the the first year and what you can see is just with this intervention at the beginning of the year the first generation students improve with this interdependence intervention their GPA is higher and on the right here um, their campus integration, which has to do with how many close friends they have and extracurriculars and academic behaviors, is um, significantly better if they have this intervention which tells them, you know, it's, it's okay, you can be interdependent here, you'll, you'll find a way, it seems to relieve the stress. We uh, showed this to the 
um, university uh, administrators. They have been very responsible. They formed an office of diversity and first gen, focus, focusing on first gen, because of course, telling students that they're going to be okay is only okay if the institution actually changes to make that be the case. And what they have done is set up mentoring relationships between undergraduates and graduate students. There's money that's available for first gen students. There's lots of seminars on what it means to have an office hour with a professor. You know, you don't have to sit there and talk for an hour. You can just go and that will be okay. Just giving lots of information that first-gen students are um, not uh, familiar with. Okay, so now I want to talk about another cultural divide quickly that um, in which we um, are experiencing in um, many of our institutions. And it's the white versus um, people of color. It's the, it's the case that um, when you are in a group that's the non-dominant uh, group, you're in a subordinate position because of your race or ethnicity, you are quite likely to experience yourself as interdependent. That's the case because what others think of you when you're in the minority position has more impact on your behavior. Um, as a function of a stereotype, you're often seen not as a separate individual, but you are seen as interdependence with others. And this interdependence often then has a sort of negative, and we know from all the work on stereotype threat, that it has very negative consequences for behavior. So our idea, and this was done with um, former student Tiffany Brannon, who's now at UCLA, um, was what if we took that interdependence that typically accompanies a racial or an ethnic um, categorization and framed it positively. There's very little positive associations with race, um, with ethnicity in our universities as they're, as they're currently set up. And the idea here was that the culture cycles of white people tend to foster independence, the culture cycles of people of color tend to foster interdependence for a, um, a variety of, of, of reasons. So what we did in this study is to, um, first working with students of, of uh, color, African American students, we had them evaluate two upcoming new courses on culture and history of African American um, context or the history and culture of European American context, and we told them that these are going to be very um, ex uh, um, elaborate courses. They had to read a website about each course. They were asked to evaluate the course, and they learned that they were going to um, understand about the history, they were going to understand about food, architecture, um, and, and uh, important literature in, in both cases. And in the course of doing it, we primed the positive cultural representations of the mainstream cultural um, context while they were reading about what the course is likely to um, hold. And the same thing for African American, this website primed positive representations of the African American cultural context, which was this idea of framing interdependence positively because it usually isn't in, the, in, the, in our mainstream institutions. And what we found that with African American students that after reading the website about an African American course on history and culture, you see that, they're, that they solve more problems correctly in the African American condition than, the Afri than black students in the mainstream condition. You see that they persist longer on a math test, a, a hard math test. And then finally, in the second set of studies where we compared African American students and European American students, and we focused on creativity, you can see that African American students, after reading about this very, um, this new course that was coming up, that was going to be offered, that focused on African American history and culture, that they actually gave more creative answers uh, uh, in this uh, condition than when they read about the European American course. Um, and what we think this did is in most of our universities, we try to relieve stereotype threat, but we really do little to change the institution to make it welcoming to the cultural context of, of, of many of our students to show that at this university, we value this, this group, these ideas, this is important. The university is changing to incorporate them. Okay, so another example from work, um, I'll go quickly here. This is um, work that's uh, uh, looking at what happens with students who come from working class backgrounds, but then 
um, and then they get a college degree, and then they go to work. And it turns out that workplaces tend to recruit and reward employees who take charge, confidently express their ideas and opinions, and promote themselves. And so even though students are more interdependent after they've gone through the college experience, they're still at a relative disadvantage. This is a, a, a new paper by Nicole Stevens and Sarah Towns in Harvard Business Review that summarizes a variety of these studies. I have to go quickly here, so I'll just point you to um, what happens. In many, many of our institutions, especially in those where people are, um, you know, they, they would love to get a job, places like Amazon or Microsoft, what you see, these institutions have independence just, just layered through them. So at Amazon, all the employees are ranked annually, and they eliminate those at the bottom. At Microsoft, employees are encouraged to compete with each other rather than to focus on the needs of the team. These are institutions that are saying the independent self is the right way to be. But if, you've, if you're just working on your independent self, you don't really have it um, honed yet, you're not going to do well in um, a lot of these settings. So what to do. Um, I think uh, as we think about the interdependence of so much of uh, America's population, we have to think about if we're really interested in workplace settings or in educational settings, we have to think about somehow disrupting the, the culture cycle of independence and trying to build in more interdependence. Um, try to think about undoing social class disparities. So, one of the things that can be done in doing that disrupting of the, of the independence is and, and making uh, cultures more aligned for people who are more familiar with interdependence, could acknowledge that social class matters. You can provide opportunities for practicing interdependence, um, for practicing independence, and you can highlight to people the independence rules of the game. People can learn independence once they know that that's what the deal is, but for lots of people, they don't understand that you need to have this kind of self. Um, in fact, it's often a clash with the kind of self that people think they should be. You can recognize the virtues of independence. One CEO of a big accounting firm that I talked to recently, who is himself a working class person who made it to the top, said he's just, He's just trying to get more and more working class people into the uh, administrative levels. He said, everybody knows that if you've come from a working class context, you know how to work. If things don't go your way, it's not going to kill you. You're not just going to fold up. You're not going to go away and cry and, and uh, you know, have to take weeks off work. You're, you don't expect things to go your way. You'll keep going. He said, but he, he keeps finding that when he um, promotes working class people, they don't, they're told that they don't fit the corporate culture. He was trying to understand, you know, what's, how do you get people who fit the corporate culture? Well, really what you need to do is help them develop an independent self. And you have to you know, build more about interdependence and, and try to reward them and pro provide incentives that have to do with interdependence. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna turn to a final um, example, that's all I have time to, I have many others, but I want to talk about criminal justice. I want to talk um, about an ongoing project in which it appears to be the case that interdependence is this, which is a common way um, of, of being, is really systematically penalized. And we've been coding a sample of um, uh, statements from prisoners who are petitioning for parole. And what you know is that more than 50% of people who are in prison have less than a high school education across the country. Many people in prison, nearly half of those have only about a fourth grade reading level who are in prison. And so it's likely, given what we know about interdependence, that people in prison are going to be have had a history of attending more to others, of paying more attention to certain in-groups, showing loyalty to those in-groups, emphasizing hierarchy, um, are more likely to conform to the groups that they've been part of, to view their relationships with the people they've been connected to as more morally binding. They're much less likely to have practice with an independent self. But it appears that an independent self is the kind of self that you have to manifest in order to get out of prison. And it seems that um, people may be spending more time in prison than they need to because they don't know that this is the way they have to um, present themselves. Um, parole boards appear to be quite biased against a more 
um, social, a more holistic, uh, a more contextual worldview. They demand extremely independent self-presentation. Parole officers ask people to know themselves, to be in control, to take personal responsibility for their choices. And we have uh, hundreds of these um, transcripts that we are analyzing right now, but let me just show you, I'm gonna show you three excerpts because I think they uh, display pretty well what I'm talking about. So here's a parole commissioner that says to um, an inmate, you learn from, from what others say. You were just so focused on others throughout today's hearing. The focus has to be on you, how you became who you are. You weren't able to tell us that, and it's just that lack of insight into yourself, your behaviors, into your gang affiliation. Here's another one. Commissioner says, you're not in control. You, it seems like you hesitate. That's probably a fair word, to take responsibility for some of your actions and instead deflect others, deflect to your family. Um, imagine that. You know, this person was talking about how um, his family influenced him and everybody in his family was doing the same thing he was, and so what do you expect? And this is one that shows that particularly well. The inmate says, I'm where crime is like seeing somebody mow their lawn. It's just a regular occurrence. The commissioner says, see someone what? The inmate says, mow their lawn. It's a regular occurrence, like where you come from, I'm pretty sure, he says to the commissioner, cutting the hedges, manicuring the lawn, something that you do regularly, right? And the commissioner says, I don't see why that has anything to do with your upbringing. The commissioner says, okay, but why did you choose going down that path that was antisocial? What was wrong, the, the path that was not within the rules? Why did you choose? This is very common, they ask people, why did you choose? The inmate says, well, for one, it was readily available. That's a good social psychological answer. And <laughs> it was right in front of me all day, every day. For two, I lacked the knowledge and experience that you develop later on to realize how stupid it is to participate in these activities. So the point is, this is Sal Limpert, one of our graduate students that's working with me and Jennifer Eberhard on, on coding these, but you can see that what's being required here is um, an, an independent self, which most of these prisoners have had very little experience with. It wouldn't be a self that would have worked for them in, in most of their contexts. Okay, so I, just to sum up quickly here, we have learned that um, from Henrik Heine and Noren Zion that psychology <laughs> Is, is weird um, and that we, have, we know a lot about this kind of um, people in these kinds of contexts. And I'm saying this is very true, not just outside the West, they're talking about the West being weird, saying that, that within the, the United States, only some people are, um, fit this, uh, this categorization and we have very many non-weird people that we don't understand well in psychology. So interdependence American style, the theorizing and measurement of mainstream psychology is still grounded in an independent model of self and that's the one that's most common in white middle class Westerners. Yet the majority of US Americans are more often familiar and practice with an interdependent model of being a self and that includes those with less societal status and power. That includes women. I didn't have time to talk about gender today, but women tend to have more interdependent selves, not because they're inherently that way or it's biological. It's just that's what they have to do. Those are their roles and requirements of being a woman, um, often. Um, people of color have more interdependent selves. Um, people in low SES working class context have more interdependent selves. And of course, I don't have time to talk about it, but people, anybody in threatening circumstances will um, manifest a more interdependent self. So because of this, psychologists need to know much more about interdependence in its many forms. Interdependence takes this sort of, these more relational phenomena that we understand, we don't understand about obligation, about loyalty, about solidarity, about adjusting or fitting in. We don't understand the importance of hierarchy, how it influences our lives. Um, relationships, roles, responsibilities, other regulation. We're really big on self-regulation, self-everything. There's a million hyphenated self-terms that we are, you know, um, that we know everything um, about. But what about other regulation? Many people are regulated by others and by norms and by their roles, and that's what we, and that's the basis of their of their behavior. And that's not an inferior way to be. It's just a different way, and we need to understand it. 
And what I've tried to show here is that leveraging interdependent agency can enhance performance and motivation, and it can bridge cultural divides just very quickly, give a sense that it could um, make a difference. And I think doing this is going to uh, help us address a huge range of societal problems that are going to increasingly confront us. And these, I said, as I said, I think we have a lot to say about political polarization. We can understand that more by understanding interdependence and the way it influences behavior. Um, we have. Uh, a big problem of people leaving the military, very interdependent environment and entering a world filled with independence and there's, there's a big clash right there. There's a big clash with the aging population. You know, some people get older, I don't know who they are, but you know, they get older and they still maintain this, they want this independence because of course that's the right kind of self to have. But in fact, you get a more interdependent self and you need to operate from that interdependent self and, and that's causing um, problems for us. So I want to um, end with um, a quote from um, William James. Now, William James was certainly uh, uh, the independent um, exemplar of his day. He was a white property owning uh, property man of, of, of high education, but he knew about the importance of the self and the sociocultural shaping of the self. And he also, he was a very well-traveled, well-read person, and he knew about other worlds and the importance of knowing, knowing other worlds. And I want to just end with his quote in which he says, the world of our present consciousness is only one of many worlds of consciousnesses that exist. And those other worlds must contain experiences which have meaning for our life as well. And I would say with respect to interdependence American style, that's true. There's, there's, a, lot, there's a lot that needs to be um, understood that has meaning for our, our psychology and, and meaning for all of us as we um, try to uh, continue our understanding of ourselves. So with that, thank you. And I want to thank my, just some of my collaborators who um, are here on, on, on this slide. So, thank you. Thank you.